number. So I'm going to go, er, everything that's on these slides is covered actually in more detail uh, in what you have in your packets. Uh, and so you can take that home and you can read it uh, at your leisure. But I want to just talk with you about uh, these provisions to give you a little bit of the flavor of what, what they mean. So to start with, and again, a myth about this law is that this is purely a federal law and the federal government's going to dictate everything and we're all going to get our health care entirely differently uh, and we're just going to have to listen to what Washington says. In fact, uh, there is a tremendous amount in this law of responsibility that's placed at the state level uh, and indeed at the community level. Uh, and there are many requirements for the states and certain things are clearly specified in the law in terms of how coverage must expand. But there is also quite a bit of room for states to make their own decisions about how things get implemented in the states. And in fact, uh, several of us, Peter Pratt from Public Sector Consultants and several others of us were talking this morning about how can we in Michigan influence how things are implemented so we get the maximum value for the funding that's there and some of the opportunities that are there to really expand coverage for citizens in our state. And it's going to be very important for coalitions to, get, to come together uh, to take advantage of these opportunities in the law. And I would encourage all of you who are part of broader organizations to think about that because this is not something that is simply going to be dictated from Washington and that's the end of it. There is going to be a lot that needs to happen here and how that happens will be critical to the future of health care in Michigan. So everybody here will have a role to play and of course one of the challenges that we have, you know as well as I do, we're going through a gubernatorial change this year, we're going through a change of in almost the entire state senate this year and so the public structures in our, there's not going to be a lot of continuity in the public structures in our state. And so it will be fundamental for those who are probably outside those public structures or for the staffers who are here who are going to stay to really become intimately aware of what's in this law and try and help make recommendations for how the next administration, the next policy leader should go forward with it. So I wanted to start a little bit with what the state actually has to do. And you know, some of these things, these are the things that actually have to happen this year. There's a lot going on right now. If any of you have met with Ken Ross, the State Insurance Commissioner, or Janet Olszewski, uh, the Head of Department of Community Health, you know that they're working very hard uh, to implement the key requirements of the law that have to go into effect this year. In fact, September 23rd, six months after the uh, President signed the law, uh, is when several of these actually go into play. So the first thing that's going to happen is this temporary high-risk pool um, which was designed to be a way for people who've been excluded from coverage because they have pre-existing conditions, they're sick, they've been sick, uh, and they were unable to get coverage on that basis for at least six months. Um, it's a way for them to get coverage. Now, this was really intended for states uh, that don't have what we have here in Michigan. Here in Michigan, uh, we have Blue Cross and Blue Shield that is the payer of last resort that is not permitted to exclude people based upon health status. And so they cannot apply this pre-existing condition exclusion. However, many people are uninsured in our state because they can't afford the health care coverage. The temporary high risk pool doesn't really address that issue. It does provide some broader coverage, it does provide some subsidies, but it's really not by itself going to fundamentally change the cost of health care. And so lots of people in our state have been guessing about how many people in our state might be in the situation where they've actually been excluded because of pre-existing conditions, not because they can't afford health care coverage. And we're thinking it could be maybe a couple thousand, somewhere in that range. It is not going to be huge. And so I think it's important for us to understand and to the expectations of what this one piece will do. I think this will be much more significant in other states where they don't have a payer of last resort. Most states, Michigan is so unique in this regard and sometimes we don't recognize that. We don't realize how different we are uh, because of the regulation that already applies to Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Very few states look like Michigan, so this will be an important component for other states. But this will go into effect in September. I believe the insurance commissioner just announced that there will be an RFP bidding process available for uh, people to bid who want to administer the temporary high-risk pool um, probably will be existing health plan or plans. Uh, it could be administered by the state, 
There will be federal funding that comes to the state to administer uh, this high-risk pool. There are other things that the state has to do this year. They have to put in place a process to review unreasonable premiums. Unreasonable is undefined in the law. And it, you know that is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, and in fact, I gave a talk similar to this uh, to a group uh, in Ann Arbor. And uh, the next day, a woman called me and said she was an, an individual. She purchased her coverage individually. And she said, my premiums are, are unreasonable. How do I get into this process? And I, I will tell you, even though the insurance commissioner has said he welcomes all comments, and I think they are taking comments from consumers, I don't think there is yet a clear process for what is determined to be unreasonable, premium increases. Uh, again, Blue Cross and Blue Shield in our state has to be reviewed right now uh, by the insurance commissioner before they increase rates in the non-group segment. Again, very different from other states. Uh, is that process reasonable, unreasonable, yet to be defined? So that's something that has to also be determined uh, this year. And the state has to set up a process for consumers to get more information about their health care options. That also uh, has to happen this year. The big things happen in 2014, but I want to encourage all of us to realize that 2014 is not that far away. Uh, and even though it's, it's going to be a far bit away for people who are uninsured, uh, and I'll talk a little bit in, in, in a little bit about the numbers of the uninsured, it's not far away in terms of all the planning that has to happen. These are very big things that need to go in place by 2014. As a state, we should be planning them today. And I, I want to focus uh, on just a few of these here. The biggest thing that you might have heard about that's in the health reform bill uh, that doesn't apply to Medicaid uh, members is uh, what's called an insurance exchange. So what is an insurance exchange? Uh, it can be really anything from an Expedia Travelocity type approach to purchasing healthcare coverage to something with, that's more like if you work for an employer like the University of Michigan who makes decisions on which health plans to offer to employees, uh, it can become like your employer and choose health plans to offer give you information about those health plans, make decisions on which health plans to author ba offer based upon the cost, uh, based upon the quality, based upon service, and things like that. And it'll probably look more like that ladder than just an electronic uh, menu of choices with regard to health care. In the health reform law, there are two exchanges. One directed at small businesses, that's the uh, shop exchange. It's the one acronym that really sounds good in the law. And you, and you might have noticed the, 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 the name for the law is the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, but people got tired of saying PPACA. P -P 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 so now they just call it ACA. The Affordable Care Act is the current name. So the acronyms are not great in this law. But the shop one is really good. You can really remember that. And that is focused uh, on small businesses, uh, generally less than 100. Uh, but it could start even smaller than that. It can start 50 or smaller. And then there's an exchange called the American Health Benefit Exchange for individuals. So people who buy their health insurance themselves um, under the health reform law would be able to buy it through uh, the, this concept of the exchange. So why is the exchange there? What's, what's good about it? It really, and again, this was actually many years ago, a Republican idea. Uh, and even though the bill didn't pass with any bipartisan votes, many of these ideas did come over the years from both parties. And this one uh, happens to have been a Republican idea as a way to make the market work better. Because if any of you have purchased your health insurance coverage uh, as an individual or as a small business, you know uh, that your rates tend to be higher uh, because the administrative cost is a lot higher for health plans to service individuals than it is to service a big group um, where the group actually does a lot of that servicing of their employees. And so this was designed to help reduce the administrative cost, increase the efficiency of the market, um, use these exchanges perhaps to negotiate better rates uh, than people could get uh, themselves. And though these are described as two ex separate exchanges, they can at state option be a single exchange. So this is an area where uh, the state has to make a choice of how they want to set up these exchanges. They can be administered by the state, or they can be administered by a nonprofit entity that the state contracts with. They can be statewide, or there can be multiple exchanges in the state. They have to be separated by geography. They cannot overlap uh, regionally. 